Vimal Kapoor, thank you so much for joining us on Bloomberg TV. Now, talk to me about Honeywell, because a lot of the companies that we speak to want to try and spin off, become leaner so that you unlock value for investment. So you mm -hmm. believe there's space for a conglomerate fairly valued? Look, uh we, we as Honeywell are seen historically as a conglomerate, but we've done a lot of work to change two things. First is a very sharp and focused portfolio, essentially focuses on three things, future of aviation, automation, and energy transition. And second thing we are focused is how we build an operating system that we run it as a company and not as a conglomerate. So we are not a holder of assets and people are doing their stuff. We run Honeywell tightly as one operation across these three mega trends. And, and so basically the megatrends are automation, aviation, and energy, and energy transition. transition. Absolutely. So w what does that mean for where you want to grow? I know you've also had a big acquisition back in December. It, it basically means each of these megatrends are strengthened themselves. So these are here forever. The aviation, we all love to travel, and the travel is going to get more electrified. We probably all going to have urban air mobility in our lifetime sometime. So there's a lot of growth there. Automation is an integral part of our life, uh, specifically industrial automation, automation in buildings to drive sustainability. Uh, and there, the biggest growth vector for us is AI, and we can talk about that. And energy transition, hopefully I don't have to explain. The planet needs more new molecules. We would essentially fo focus on green molecules, less on yeah. green electrons. And each of these growth vectors are here for several years, which makes Honeywell a compelling proposition for our customers and for our shareholders. But so if you look at aviation, and again, a lot of, I guess, shareholders say, look, you can unlock value, but at the same time, you're seeing a trend, uh, for example, Boeing possibly looking to reacquire spirit, mm -hmm. of some of the supply chains coming back in-house. Yeah. What does that mean for how much growth you're expecting in, in that industry? Yeah, it's a, for us, our business model is very different. You know, we don't have one concentrated product lines in our business in aerospace. We are nose-to-tail company, and we have multiple systems uh, from cockpit controls to engines, APUs, environmental controls, satellite comms in a plane. And we typically go to an OEM like Boeing, Airbus, Bombardier, Embraer, and position our entire product line because we specialize in systems in a plane. So we get a lot of content, and... In every plane you fly, there will be have a significant Honeywell content. So your question, our equipment is so critical, and because it's a system approach, we are not really one product which right. will backward integrable by, by anybody. But it, how does aviation actually change from here? How much uh, electrification. of it will be green? Right. Electrification is the name of the game in future. I think in our lifespan, how much of uh, will we fly in a plane with hydrogen uh, cells, uh, hydrogen fuel cells? I can't... Uh, this is what, 10 years away, 15 years away? I think technology is being developed, but what's available right here and now is use of sustainable aviation fuel. That's a technology which we provide through our energy transition part of our business, and our aerospace business tests that in our engines and our APUs, and that's something which is available today. Uh, you can blend all the way up to 50% of sustainable aviation fuel in the jet fuel, and that to me is available today. Where it will go forward is more electrification of different, different parts of the aeroplane. Think about cooling in the plane. Think about uh, propulsion in the plane. And that really positions the urban air mobility as the first yeah. platform, which is be totally electrified. Uh, and that's what we're really working on in the future of aviation. Uh, how would you describe U.S. manufacturing right now? Again, there have been you know, problems with supply chains, which also mean that there's been a repatriation of supply mm -hmm. chains. I don't know whether that's the end of multilateralism, mm -hmm. but certainly it's given a massive boost to a lot of demand coming from the U.S. Yeah, so U.S. supply chain, clearly there's more focus to have more indigenous supply chain in the U.S. for the last several years. Specifically in aerospace, there's a lot of rebuild of capacity. A lot of capacity was shed off in terms of during the COVID and a lot of people went off work. And rebuilding the capacity with increased demand is an immediate challenge and opportunity for in aerospace, which we are working on. Yeah. But we also see in U.S. expansion of capacity in semiconductor fabs, in EV vehicle batteries, and others, industries of some nature. It will take a while for that capacity to set up. It's not going to happen overnight. But clearly we see the trend and it helps us in our automation business because we automate a lot of these facilities in battery manufacturing, in giga factories, uh, and that's part of our growth vector. And so automation or AI? Because AI could also help, for example, in supply chain, I guess, understanding where, what you need, mm -hmm. where you need it so that you preempt Yeah, shortage. we have been using that for probably three to four years, those techniques. But what excites me about AI is, in context of industrial world, this is one of the best tools to uh, solve the skill issue. Right. Because skill shortage is a huge problem to all our industrial customers, whether it's people to how to operate the equipment, how to maintain it. 
and AI makes a average person more productive. The example, the thing in point is, I came to UK as a, to live here in 2010. I, first couple of months, I used to use paper maps and always used to lose my way. Then came the Google Maps, and I never lost my way. So it's a, it's, it was early version of AI where I was being assisted right. by somebody versus I was trying to be intelligent by my, myself. And I think in that same context, when you translate an industrial word, an operator or a maintenance technician, when assisted by a lot of our AI tools, right. makes them highly productive. So for our customers, it's a great opportunity to drive productivity and revenue growth, less about uh, you know job displacement and other conversations. But I was going to ask you about job displacement, because it, it must also actually m mean that you lose jobs, and so part of that is retraining. I, uh, yeah, I look at it, you know, it, there's always a productivity tool which comes in every few years. So this is the new productivity tool. Then skills migrate to a higher level. That's how I think about it. And when four or five years back, robotics process automation yeah. was a big deal in 2018, 2019. And that wave came in and it uh, created certain process yeah. automation. Now it's AI. So I think the way I think about it is in context of industrial company is that how do we use it to drive productivity? And then the next wave comes and we have to reskill ourselves to, to move on to the next level. What's the most frustrating thing about what we're, you're trying to achieve? I don't know whether there's a misunderstanding. I don't know how many times a day you get asked what you're buying next yeah. because you're also seeing a, as a real M&A play. Yeah, so M&A play for Honeywell is uh, all about how do we focus our portfolio into three of those yeah. mega trends. I want to make Honeywell focused on future of aviation, automation, energy transition, and acquisition yeah. we did in Carrier. Uh, the security business, which we expect to complete it in course of 24, mm -hmm. is a great example of type of acquisitions we want to do. It makes yeah. us stronger player in automation mm -hmm. as a segment, uh, and you expect us to be more active in both some subtraction and some addition yeah. in our portfolio. So, how much more can we expect? A lot of M&A. I mean, you, so, you started as a chief executive in June. Yes. In December, mm -hmm. you were you were buying a company worth five billion. So, mm -hmm. you didn't waste any time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is something which uh, you know we compete in that segment, so we reasonably well knew about that asset. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I would say to answer your question, we have committed that we spend uh, eight billion a year of capital in terms of capital redeployment, and I'll, some part of it is fixed in terms of dividend and share buyback. Uh, but I like to have more bias of that capital spend on acquisition to really re to rebuild the Honeywell portfolio, which is more growth oriented, and aligned to the right new mega trends. And this is mainly in the U.S. because of the U.S. Not really. exceptionalism. Not really. I mean, uh, I think we always have done a lot of acquisition of European-based assets also over the last many years. I mean, in fact, we have a long history of a lot of acquisitions in Germany, in U.K., other parts of Europe. Uh, yeah, it depends on the asset quality. We're really not biased on where it should be really based in. Uh, how much was inflation tough for, for you in terms of wage negotiations, but also just the price of your components? It was, uh, I, when it started in 21, I would say it certainly was a, a headwind. But we learned through practices really to professionalize our pricing processes, really understand how to capture pricing, how to drive value. And it's one of the best processes today where... We, tr we do the balance from our shareholder perspective, the inflation not being a headwind, and from our customers give them value for money for the products which we deliver to them. Uh, when you look at the years ahead, I know the, the energy transition has disappointed many because it, it, it was quite fierce and then now it's maybe taken a little bit of a backstab. Mm -hmm. If this is your third pillar, yeah. how fast do you see it accelerating? Look, uh, we are in the, uh, we do two, the, let me retract back. For energy transition to happen, you can do three things. Energy efficiency, right. green molecules, yep. and green electrons. We have been in energy efficiency business for the last 40 years, so that's more and more demand is coming. The what new has to be done is green electrons and green molecules. I think we all see a lot of green electrons happening all around us, a lot more renewables mm -hmm. all around us. The green molecules haven't moved at the same pace. Mm -hmm. Uh, it requires capital, return on capital sometimes is less, so we need some government policy, some support, some tax credits, etc. Uh, and I, I think that's moving at a slower pace than I would like it to see. But I'm very optimistic that new technologies like sustainable aviation fuel, hydrogen, more use of carbon capture is going to become an integral part of uh, energy transition in the times to come. Are you frustrated by your share price? I, yes, I am. It will be fair to say that uh, we are not getting fair valuation for uh, what we do, uh, but that's my job to tell our story. And Honeywell is a great portfolio, the things we do, and it's growth-oriented. 
and we are going to we are going to uh, deliver our results and we get a fair valuation through our results